Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool every single day. Hope you guys are all having an incredible Tuesday. It's Tuesday, right, Blake? It's Tuesday? That's Tuesday. Good. Tuesday, it's confirmed. I knew it was Tuesday. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about cults. We're going to be talking about Xbox backwards compatibility. I've got SSX3 sitting right there, and I'm not playing it yet because I've got to give it to you. I've got to give a rundown to you guys, but first, this is dedicated to Mario Henry 90. Electric Playground was my favorite as a teen. I still remember you guys talking about the Nintendo DS when it was revealed along with new Super Mario Brothers. He misses those days, but you don't got to miss them. It's just a brand new EP for you, and this rundown is all yours. Warner Brothers is praying that they can get the DC movie universe back on track with a bold new project. The studio is reportedly developing a big screen movie based on DC's Birds of Prey, an all-female team of superheroes that in the comics has featured the likes of Barbara Gordon, uh, who's Batgirl, or Oracle, uh, spoiler alert, Black Canary, and Harley Quinn. The studio was previously developing a Gotham City Sirens movie, which had a similar premise, but it looks like that project has morphed into this one. The Birds of Prey film adaptation will be headlined by Suicide Squad star Ma uh, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. And as for a director, Deadline reports that Warner Brothers has picked a young filmmaker, uh, Kathy Yan, to helm the project. The only other movie she's directed is the recent Sundance hit, Dead Pigs, so this will be her biggest undertaking by far. Expect more details soon. Now, this sounds like a cool project to me. I think that that's uh, an interesting direction to go into. It's been kind of surprising that they haven't kind of leaned in to all of the uh, ancillary projects that could come out of the Batman universe. Batman has been this sort of go-to you know, money-making earner for Warner Brothers and DC in the movie universe for a long time, but they haven't really given us, you know, great Robin projects or Nightwing or Batgirl projects. And this seems like, a, you know, a great direction to go, but I think they have to solve that Batman problem first, you know? Is Ben Affleck gonna be our DC movie universe Batman going forward, or are they gonna recast that? And I think, until you figure out who your Batman is, who the leader of the family is, it's pretty tough to kind of start thinking about uh, the other characters and where else to go with all of this stuff. So it'll be interesting to watch this. Margot Robbie did a great job as Harley Quinn. Um, great characters to, to pull from, and I think it's interesting to go with uh, indie develop or indie filmmakers uh, to sort of make this a little bit more authentic. So we'll see how this all comes together. I still have hope. I still have faith. Come on, DC. Come on, Warner Brothers. You can do it. Uh, now, Nintendo is experimenting with some cool new technology for future hardware. A recent patent filed by Nintendo reveals that the company is developing a new kind of screen-to-screen -screen communication method. Basically, users will be able to touch two uh, or more screens together and then relay information between them to create unique game experiences. For example, users could flick a digital ball from one screen to another with the information passing between the devices instantly. Nintendo has already used second screen technology on the 3DS and the Wii U, but the thing that makes this unique is that it would be used between separate devices. Just because they filed the patent doesn't mean they're actually going to use it though, so it's unclear if this second screen technology will find its way to a future device. This sounds a lot like um, online play to me, which... <laughs> I think a lot of developers have already been uh, using on uh, PlayStation 4, the Xbox, and the PC for a long time. Um, I, I guess it's instant sort of feedback and possibly leading to some pretty cool things that they could do with a couple of switches paired up. Uh, but it doesn't seem that, you know, unless we're talking about using the Switch connected to the base station and suddenly it's kind of like a Wii U type of experience and then you can walk away with it. That's pretty cool. One of the functionalities of the Wii U that I kind of miss is that second screen sort of looking down, looking up, looking... What didn't work all the time, but it was kind of cool. And I honestly, when I was playing Zelda Breath of the Wild, I thought, man, it'd be great if I could just look at the map or look at my you know, my tablet and then look up at the screen, you know, instead of having to go into the menus and cycle to the right page and all that. So that was one of the cool things about the Wii U. We're all quick to dismiss it, but it was pretty rad. And it's also one of the great things about the 3DS. Remember how skeptical all of us lifers were when they announced the first DS and then the 3DS and then the Wii U, but second screen kind of game design is pretty damn cool. I think Portable, you know, taking a, a core experience portable is a better, you know, implementation of that kind of concept. But second screen design is pretty solid, so we'll see what happens there. 
All right, now Monster Hunter World is getting its biggest and most complicated event yet. Capcom has announced that a, lim a limited time siege event begins in the game tomorrow and will see players take on the massive elder dragon known as Kulve Teroth. The catch is that, I hope I said that right, the catch is that you'll need no less than 16 different players to bring them down. 16 players will meet up in the game's online gathering hub and then break off into groups of four to track them down with each group's progress contributing to the overall siege. This sounds incredible. It's a little complicated, much like most of the multiplayer in the game. There's no telling how long you'll have to figure it out because Capcom hasn't said when the event will end. This sounds like it's gonna be a huge chunk of time. So uh, I think, uh, be prepared. I think this is running throughout the whole weekend here, uh, probably. Uh, so I would imagine that people are gonna be uh, dedicating a huge chunk of time to whittling away the hit points and the, the life force of this huge Elder Dragon. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some footage of all of this stuff. I think that'll be super fun. I skipped the story, though. Uh, it looks like EA might have learned their lesson from Star Wars Battlefront 2. Uh, speaking with The Verge, EA Worldwide Studios Executive Vice President Patrick Soderlund has spoken out about the controversy surrounding the Battlefront 2 loot boxes and microtransactions. He admits that they made mistakes with the game, which have had an impact on the company, and he promises that they're going to rectify those mistakes and learn from them in the future. Battlefront 2 received harsh criticism for, for its complicated progression system, which made players, many players claimed was set up specifically to encourage them to spend extra money on loot boxes. The backlash forced EA to overhaul everything, and they're just now reintroducing microtransactions into the game. These new comments from Patrick Soderlund indicate that EA will think twice about using loot boxes and microtransactions in the future. The greatest teacher failure is, hold on, I gotta do that right. I gotta do it like Yoda. The greatest teacher failure is, very close. Uh, this is great. This is uh, a mea culpa on behalf of a human being at Electronic Arts. They're not just this giant monolithic establishment. People made these games, people made mistakes, and as long as EA uh, really moves to rectify that, and I've heard, I've heard uh, people reporting that um, you know Anthem has learned a tremendous, the people at Bioware developing Anthem have learned a tremendous amount of some of the stumbles that Battlefront 2 has made. Uh, I think it's important now for EA to move past this players first BS, uh, you know, um, catchphrase or motto that they've had and say, you know, and, and be kind of point blank that of course we need gamers to love our company and of course we need gamers to believe in the products that we're building and the people that are building them and they need to make us feel that. You know, things like backwards compatibility for SSX3, fantastic. A Burnout Paradise Remastered, fantastic. You know, scaling back and, and sort of relaunching uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 and listening to people, also a fantastic move. We need more of that. We need more great news from Electronic Arts. They've got the money in the bank. They've got the brands. They've got the history. They certainly have the development talent to turn things around. And that's, that's precisely what I'm expecting them to do. And I think that they're going to have a good E3 with lots of good announcements and good news. They need to, you know, also figure out the Need for Speed brand as well. That's been kind of squandered the last couple of hits, you know, attempts, uh, steps up to the bat. That's the analogy that I was looking for. Uh, all right. After shooting an air ball, speaking of sports metaphors, a new basketball franchise is hoping for a slam dunk. Developer Saber Interactive has announced that NBA Playgrounds 2, a sequel to last year's arcade style basketball game, which was all right. Th uh, this time around, they're doubling down on the online content because the game will have a new season mode as well as a new championship ranked mode with different divisions. It's no surprise that they're adding more online features. The first NBA Playgrounds featured re uh, received mostly mediocre reviews, but one aspect players enjoyed was the online component. So hopefully it will be better this time around. NBA Playgrounds will hit uh, 2 will hit the PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Switch this summer. Uh, this sounds great. I mean, arcade basketball is a staple. It's a it's a great part of the video game uh, industry and our history. Uh, NBA Jam is sort of sitting on the bench. Another sports analogy for you. Don't know why. Uh, in the interim, NBA Playgrounds can come out and sort of give us the, the sort of arcade basketball experience that we're all looking for, especially those that, you know, play couch co-op. Uh, the Switch is a perfect machine for something like this. That's the, that's the system that I played the first Playgrounds on. Um, m my only advice to Saber Interactive is that if they manage to pull this off and sink that three or whatever sports analogy you want to use, don't do another one for a few more years. Let 
NBA playgrounds to live, uh, you know, maybe embellish it with new content. A lot of it should be free, but don't come out with another one because if there's any lesson to be learned uh, f for these arcade sports games, you can't bring them out like their regular league sports titles, the big, you know, licensed franchised games out there. You can't do that because you will just kill off all the enthusiasm. We saw that happen with Blitz. We saw that happen with uh, NBA uh, Street and FIFA Street and NFL Street. Uh, we, we saw it, uh, you know, with Jam. So, like, make this great and sit on it and let us love it for a while and make it a go-to experience. That would be amazing. That would be fantastic. Uh, chances are if they do that, then the EA, the, the lumbering, slumbering giant, will wake up and go, wait a minute, we have NBA Jam. People want it. Let's crush them. And we might have an arcade sports war again, which would be all right. FIFA Street, if you can bring that back, that would rock. Uh, all right, it's time to uh, move on from the rundown and take a look back in the rearview mirror with this day in Everything Cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for April 17th. On this day in 1937, not one, but two iconic cartoon characters made their debut. Daffy Duck and the bumbling hunter Elmer J. Fudd appeared for the first time in the Warner Brothers cartoon Porky's Duck Hunt. Porky had made his debut two years earlier and was actually the first big Warner Brothers cartoon character, and with the introduction of Daffy and Elmer, the animation team grew their roster. Daffy and Elmer were popular with audiences, but as you can see, they looked very different from what they look like today, and it wasn't until the 1940s that they evolved into their more recognizable selves. It also wasn't until the 1940s that the world saw the introduction of the most memorable Warner Brothers character, Bugs Bunny. His first cartoon didn't premiere until 1940. Watch up, Doc! On April 17, 1987, a different kind of animated franchise found its way to video games. The original Fist of the North Star game was released on the NES in Japan, although it wouldn't find its way to North America for another two years. The game was based on the Japanese manga and anime franchise of the same name, and similar to other NES games like Double Dragon, it was a side-scrolling beat-em-up with players punching and kicking their way through enemies. It was one of the first big video games based on a manga or anime property, and it also helped introduce newcomers, particularly Westerners, to the franchise for the first time. Dozens of other Fist of the North Star video games have followed. April 17th, 2011 saw television audiences venture to Westeros for the very first time. The first episode of the fantasy series Game of Thrones premiered on HBO, introducing viewers to all the characters and places that have since become household names. Based on the fantasy books by author George R. R. Martin, several adaptation attempts had already been made, with HBO picking up the rights in 2007. The show spent years in development and had some major stumbles along the way, and HBO even reshot the pilot episode a second time, recasting many of the parts at the last minute. It paid off, and the first episode was a hit, drawing 2.2 million viewers in its initial airing, and it only built on that audience going forward. Today, Game of Thrones has become one of the most successful and iconic television shows of all time, defining a new era of fantasy television that saw a stronger emphasis on realistic stories, characters, and production design. It's scheduled to end with Season 8 in 2019. All right, you guys, I've got a very cool Reviews on the Run uh, to discuss today, another live Reviews on the Run. Uh, this is a uh, documentary series called Wild Wild Country that the Duplass Brothers executive produced. And uh, I was told by my friend Mike Wilson uh, who, from Devolver I, I, that I definitely need to watch this show. It's a documentary series over six episodes, and it tells the story of the Rajneesh, uh, led by Bhagwan Rajneesh, who was later uh, uh, sort of recognized recognized as Osho. He became to be called Osho later on in his life. Um, and it's all about their efforts to uh, settle in a town called Antelope, Oregon, um, this little tiny town with a population of about 40 people. Um, Bhagwan Rajneesh had set up this huge industry, um, kind of, he became like this cultist, this guru, this spiritual guru for you know, hundreds of people, then thousands of people, then hundreds of thousands of people, and he chose to settle in America. He started everything in India and then, you know, chose to settle in America even though Rajneesh uh, sort of establishment started to happen all over the world. He amassed an incredible amount of wealth and was purchasing all kinds of uh, 
through the church or through his uh, teachings, uh, a bunch of Rolls Royces and Learjets, and eventually many buildings in this town, and much to the chagrin of the uh, local inhabitants that had been there forever, which were primarily, you know, sort of uh, good Christian folk uh, who were really freaked out by this, uh, you know, brand new population of all of these red cloaked people. Uh, and I didn't wear this on purpose today, my red shirt today, but uh, basically, this uh, this religious cult erupts around them, and it freaks out the town folk. And they start talking to all kinds of uh, uh, you know powers of authority out there. And eventually, the the sort of U.S. government gets involved, and all kinds of hell breaks loose. And that's what this documentary series was about. Now, I grew up in the '70s and the '80s. Uh, and I remember hearing murmurs of the Rajneesh, and I remember on the streets of Vancouver there were lots of people that were dressed head to toe in red. You see that occasionally still, um, but this series really takes you into this world, this idea that this, uh, this you know, figurehead in India becomes this cultural phenomenon that's sort of recognized globally. And there's a, a ton of incredible news footage and news clips and also mass media footage, like mainstream broadcast news talking about the Rajneesh and talking about Bhagwan and, and uh, you know, the insidious, insidiousness or the implied insidiousness of this, uh, of this cult. Um, and you really get a sense of uh, the danger that existed for these people who, for the most part, as it's represented by some really in-depth and, and heartfelt interviews all the way through the series, they really just wanted to, you know, practice their, their peace and love and kind of hippie virtues. Um, but they were loud and proud about it, and as exemplified by there's, you know, this this bright red and maroon sort of uh, costuming, this out these outfits that everybody wore, and they they sort of, you know, they weren't like the Harry Krishnas, you know, beating on drums and stuff that you'll see in dif different uh, cities as you're walking around downtown areas. But you could tell that the Rajneesh were there everywhere, and I think that this became a uh, a symbol of. Uh, um, you know, they became vilified. And so people from all over the the community and then eventually from all over the country were pointing their fingers and, and you basically get a sense that they they were not welcome in America and not welcome in this town in Oregon. And so we get to know the people that were involved through this series. And it's it's a beautifully told tale, especially as it wraps up, because you're the whole time you're watching it, it's six episodes, a little bit more than six hours worth of material. The whole time you're watching it is like, is this going to just go down in a blaze of you know, glory? Is this going to be the, the Branch Davidian thing all again? Or are FBI agents going to storm this and people going to get shot to hell? Because eventually the Rajneesh start to arm themselves because they're worried about their own health and well-being. And there's internal power struggles, particularly with, uh, 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 oh, I forget her name, the, uh, the, the uh, Bagram uh, Rajneesh's secretary, she, uh, I think, what's her name? I got to figure out her name. I can't, I can't not know her name. Um, with uh, Sheila Bernstell, who, who is, uh, her name is Ma Anand Sheila. She becomes, it's just a lot of, you know, interesting names to remember in this. She becomes very, very protective of her position and her power uh, sort of, uh, starts to grow and she gets very threatened by new individuals that sort of worm their way into the Bagram's life and she starts to fight back and you sense uh, you know that things got a little hairy and a little creepy and freaky and people eventually do end up going to prison but the the, the way that this whole story unfolds is so worth watching. I will say that the documentary at six hours is a little bit too long. There were times where you feel like they're repeating kind of sequences over and over again. And, uh, you know, there's you, you feel the threat from the townsfolk of Oregon and you feel like the pushback from the Rajneesh and you see the media clips and it just seems to happen, you know, over a few different episodes, and I kind of feel like things should have been tightened a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, by the end of it, it's so riveting and you're so moved because people had their lives just devastated, their beliefs, their their idea of, uh, you know, this peace and serenity and this utopian kind of ideal, and then it was just fully ripped apart. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of questions. There's, there's some ambiguity. It's not really like... A, it's not sort of painting a picture of uh, you know this this horrendous evil that occurred or anything like that. And I liked 
the humanity that's pervasive in this documentary, and it's worth sticking with until the very end. And I, I guarantee you're going to be intrigued. The person that stood out for me, and I'll, I'll just grab his name too because there are so many names in here, was uh, Philip uh, Tolks, who is this lawyer that's very successful in Los Angeles and ends up, you know, representing the Bogwan, the Bogwan, and. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, you know, sort of becomes a figurehead and a leader within the Rajneesh community. But his tale is so personal and he's, he's so, uh, you know, el articulate in his reflection. And you can see the emotion across his face. And the filmmakers in the new interviews really capture, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of devastation that happened as an, on an individual level, you know? And you also see, because you see all of these film clips and TV clips from when they, these people were really young, and that's juxtaposed against these, uh, you, know, you know, people look pretty good still, but their age has definitely affected them, and the experiences that they have definitely affected them, and you see that on the faces. And uh, it's riveting stuff. And I, I thought that it was kind of crazy timing, especially with uh, Far Cry 5 out there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to just sink into this thing and learn a little bit more about uh, the Rajneesh cult and the history there. Uh, and it's a, a terrific six hours. Not all of it is great, uh, but definitely the summation is fantastic. It's a really, really nice sort of collection of uh, uh, important historical moments that I think you're going to be fascinated with, particularly if you've been playing Far Cry 5. I'm going to give Wild Wild Country an 8.5 out of 10. And speaking of Far Cry 5, we've got an interview with one of the cult experts that uh, actually um, worked with the developers on making Far Cry 5 so authentic. Let's take a look. This is something new for Electric Playground. I am with an author and a cult expert. This is Rick Ross. We are talking about cults as they relate to Far Cry 5. It's great to meet you, sir. Great to meet you. And I, I have to imagine that that must have been an interesting phone call from a video game company to come and participate in their project. Yes, it was. Yeah. It was a very interesting uh, proposition and I was very happy to uh, get involved. How did you get involved? How did you get in, you know, have this fascination with cults? Was this something that was personal to you when you were younger? Yeah, it was personal. Yeah. Uh, in the early 80s, my grandmother lived in a nursing home that uh, the paid professional staff was infiltrated by a group wow. that targeted the elderly. And I found out about it and uh, worked with the director of the nursing home to basically get them out, mm. have them fired. There were about five people that were recruiting. We're seeing, um, you, constantly, sort of this this fascinating kind of overview of cults in our society. What has uh, give us some commonalities of cults? Because obviously we know about uh, the Branch Davidians and and uh, you know some some huge in the news kinds of cults over the years. But I would imagine technology has allowed cults to just grow and and evolve into interesting different dimensions these days? Well, cults are using YouTube, they're mm -hmm. using social media, people are following cult leaders on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, they're, 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 they're involved with Facebook, and some of the social media is now monitoring the, the particularly vicious and pernicious groups. Uh, but I think what you see in all these groups are three basic characteristics mm -hmm. that they all have. One is an absolute totalitarian leader, that is the defining element of the group and the driving force, and that leader it becomes an object of worship. Yeah. Number two, the group has a system of coercive persuasion where they break people down to gain undue influence, uh, to get them to do things like free labor or give all their assets to the group. And then finally, if the group is to be considered a destructive cult, they hurt people in some tangible way, and that's why they get in trouble. So either they defraud people or they violate labor laws or it can escalate to physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence, criminal behavior. But you look at those three things, the leader, the process, and the harm being done, yeah. and you see that all of the groups, regardless of what they say they believe or what they promote they're about, 
they have those characteristics. Is this something that, you know, is a little more prevalent in America, in the United States? I mean, there, it's obvious that there is a lot of turmoil happening with uh, the U.S. political landscape and uh, a lot of divisiveness that's happening down there. Is it it's sort of engendering the rise of cults? in new ways? Well, I think there are many groups that have come to the United States, like um, Reverend Moon's Unification Church, yeah. uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh in the 80s, who came to Oregon and created his own city, mm -hmm. Rajneesh Puram. And the reason they come to the U.S. and the reason there is quite a bit of activity in the U.S. is the United States Constitution and the First Amendment, mm. which gives these groups uh, special rights and privileges and protection that they would not otherwise have, let's say in Europe or Asia. Yeah. So basically, the U.S. has money, yeah. the U.S. has a lot of people, and the U.S. has special protection. You can get tax-exempt status. You don't have to pay taxes on your property. Right. And when somebody criticizes the way you behave, you can say, wait a minute. Um, you're persecuting me, and that's my First Amendment rights that you're treading on. Uh, though in some cases in the U.S. now, particularly regarding children, yeah. uh, the government is saying, wait a minute, you've got the right to believe whatever you want but not do whatever you want in the name of your beliefs. Right, and I would imagine that that's a bit of a quagmire because I would imagine that uh, there's a lot of religions or, or want-to-be religions that maybe cross the threshold and become cults. And I'm, Is there a classification system? Obviously, there's a massive negative you know, stigma attached to being labeled a cult, but I would imagine there's a lot of people that feel what they're doing is their own religious freedom, right? Well, I mean, everyone is free to believe whatever they want. Yeah. The question is actions. Yes. Uh, the question is behavior. So, for example, if you believe that uh, your group believes that no medical care should be uh, sought, Right. or no prescribed medication should be taken, that's your right. But if you have a, a minor child mm. and you impose that belief on that child, that child suffers and dies, the judicial system in the United States says, wait just a minute, we're going to prosecute you. And there are groups in the U.S. like uh, Followers of Christ, General Assembly of the Firstborn, that parents have been prosecuted simply because they denied medical care to their child. And in about 80% of the cases, according to research, that child's life could have been saved easily by just simply showing up at a hospital ER or a doctor's office. For sure, yeah. So I think you can believe whatever you want, but you cannot don't behave put, however you yeah, want. Yeah, don't put people at risk. How about the game? How realistic is the depiction of how cults can can you know be generated and and the, the personalities that are a, a part of a cult do you think the game sort of creates for us how realistic is well, it well I, th I think it's very real mm -hmm. i mean basically um what they've done is they have historically um grabbed facts and aspects of various groups that have existed and do exist mm -hmm. to the extent that they have created a composite it's not uh, a duplicate of any single group, but in each of its aspects, the leadership, uh, the dynamics, the particulars of control, the compound, they have created very vividly uh, a very historically grounded real experience where someone who comes into that world yeah. is really experiencing a destructive cult. There's obviously a great deal of attention paid to the recreation of this Montana environment for us. Have you ever personally encountered anything like that in a location like Montana? Well, sure. I mean, there, there, there was a group uh, that was a kind of new age group yeah. that had a large compound in Montana. Mm. I mean, uh, that's a historical fact. And I have worked in Montana, uh, in the Bitterroot Valley, uh, near Hamilton, and I've flown through Missoula. So yes, there are groups that seek out isolated rural areas where they can set up a compound for the purpose of social isolation. And there have been a number of groups that have done that historically. Uh, one group in Montana, other groups in Uganda, in, in, in Guyana, Jim Jones, the People's Temple. Yes. So there are many, many groups yearning for Zion, the polygamist ranch that was set up in Texas, where um, Child Protective Services uh, came in, 
with uh, law enforcement. They raided that uh, ranch and they pulled out 400 children. And they found out that there was terrible abuse that went on in there. That's a very uh, uh, more recent example. But there are historical examples of compounds and recent examples as well. And I guess the best outcome from something that's this kind of scintillating and fascinating is that there's education sort of passed on and people can glean from this and, and look for the warning signs and not, not join cults. I hope so. Yeah. I, I think that what, uh, what the game can do is besides uh, having an exhilarating experience that brings someone into a world that they've only heard of superficially yeah. and now they can drill into it and interact with its principles and deal with this world almost like you know they're a part of it in, in a true sense. I think that really will raise and can raise awareness about dangerous groups uh, that have totalitarian leaders and what they sound like, what they look like, what they feel like, which can help people to see them that they might not otherwise see in the world around them. You can feel that we are creeping towards the edge. Man, I never thought I'd be talking so much about cults on Electric Playground. Uh, but uh, it's funny how the world works, right? Cults are a part of uh, our existence out there. And, you know, the, the cult dynamic in Far Cry 5 is very special and very cool. And the developers at UB Montreal did an amazing job. Uh, and speaking of Far Cry 5, I have a very special gift that I'm about to give to one lucky viewer of our live show. Uh, we're gonna do this from time to time, give away codes when we're live. So make sure that uh, if you can, come and join us for as many EP lives as you can. Uh, but we appreciate all of you folks that are watching this in the archive. But uh, I've got this uh, big on the screen right now. It should be legible. I'm going to flip my iPad around and uh, hopefully somebody gets this quickly. But here's a, a free code for Far Cry 5 for the Xbox One. Can you see that okay? Can you see it okay? Uh, when you set the table, Just like that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So. So you can see that, and I'll flip that around to open up the chat in a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about the Xbox One. Um, yeah, this is Sony's big week with God of War, no question about that. The God of War experience is phenomenal. I've actually got uh, uh, Johnny Millennium uh, is uh, going to be coming in tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about Far Cry, or we're going to be talking about God of War, but also a little bit of the, about the PlayStation 4 in general. Uh, but um, it's definitely their week, but the Xbox One is also having a killer week as well. One of the things that they have done today is unlock some new uh, backwards compatible games in their library, and and uh, backwards compatible could be something that we overlook a little bit um, in our medium because this is always a forward, I talk about this all the time, it's always a forward thinking, forward looking, uh, you know, medium where we're just thinking about what's new, what's next, what's hot, what's coming. Uh, but there are incredible games in the Xbox library and the people at Microsoft really know that. And unfortunately on the PlayStation 4, you, you can't really play classic games unless you sign up for their you know, their PS Now service or you download the uh, the PlayStation 2 games and you buy them again, basically. And it looks like that's probably going to be kind of a similar type of experience with the Nintendo Switch. They haven't even really announced their backwards uh, compatibility solution or their virtual console kind of idea yet. Um, and so meanwhile, Xbox has kind of carved out this interesting stake and they've, you know, I think dipped their toes in and they've given us maybe, you know, they think they started with 30 or 40 and then they went to 100. And now that list, that backwards compatibility list is very, very long. And I, um, I saw Red Dead Redemption was on that list and I looked for my copy of it, but I think I've got that game uh, specifically on the, or we've got that game specifically on the PlayStation 3. So I still haven't tracked down a copy of Red Dead Redemption, but that's a huge game to be able to play on your brand new Xbox One console. Uh, but then they've also dipped into their catalog for the original Xbox, and we've got games like SSX3, which is still, for my money, the best snowboarding game that's been released. Ninja Gaiden Black was, or Ninja Gaiden Black was the, one of the first uh, original Xbox games that they came out. Still a phenomenal game, phenomenal experience. Panzer Dragoon Orta just came out today uh, as a backwards compatible title. And so what happens is if you have these discs, you can load them into your brand new uh, Xbox One, 
I've got the X right here, which actually, you know, upreses some of this content for some of these games, which is another incredibly cool benefit. Um, and you can play these games again. And like I say all the time on the show, through Buried Treasure and all kinds of other stuff, some of these classic games are still incredibly fun. I'm right in the middle of a little SSX3. Um, the first thing that you're going to notice is that, uh, it, well, it, it looks terrific. There's a great sort of up-res render that's happening off of the uh, Xbox One X hardware, um, but it's also a 4x3 kind of squashed uh, picture for 16x9. Now, the, the original Xbox titles will play in 16x9 if the software allowed for that, um, and I think some might be auto, and some you have to go into the options and, and, and fix all that. I seem to remember playing SSX in widescreen, but for some reason this looks a little squashed to me. Still, uh, incredibly playable. I'm going to stream some of this um, a little bit later, I think, because I've been dying to play this game for a long time. And I, th I just think it's, it's, a, it's a great gift back to people that have been with a machine or with a, a, you know, an ecosystem for a long time to suddenly ha have access to that catalog. Um, you know, physical media, as we're constantly reminded, is is fading, you know, like a lot of people are, are choosing and opting to just go digital only. And so people that have these old discs, you know, have tried to figure out how they're going to be able to play this stuff. And some of these old machines, they, you know, they might have power supplies or issues that, that force them to not be you know, power supplies that stop working or other issues that, that just make these machines really not viable in modern day. So it's, it's a great gift to be able to take something off of your shelf that you feel should work forever and it works on new hardware. And this is a 15 year old game. This is a game that came out in 2003 and it's still super fun and still super playable. But let's take a look at, uh, let's throw in Ninja Gaiden, uh, Gaiden. Is it Gaiden or Gaiden? Somebody correct me on that one. Uh, let's quit this and we'll, let, we'll throw in uh, Ninja Gaiden Black. N nin what do you think, Blake? Is it Ninja Gaiden or Ninja, Ninja Gaiden? Okay, Ninja Gaiden Black. Here we go. We'll throw that in right now. So I'll eject my SSX if it comes out. Come on. Unless it doesn't. Unless I, I have just uh, squashed this whole idea right now and it doesn't, it doesn't eject on me. Come on. Are you quitting? It's not ejecting. Uh-oh. Well, that might be... Uh, <laughs> that might be that. All right. Well, I'll try to figure out ejecting my SSX3 uh, disc and popping in another one. In the meantime, let's take a look at this buried treasure. Let's jump into our DeLoreans and travel back to 2005 and take a look at a game for the PlayStation 2, The Mark of Cree, which was developed by Sony San Diego. And boy, did this take my breath away when this came out. It was a cartoony looking game with cell shaded graphics. There was a lot of this cell shaded stuff happening around that time. This game came out though, and as cartoony as it looked, it was also ultra violent. And you played a guy that was basically The Rock. It, it was The Rock before The Rock became a superstar. His name is Rao, and he does get this mark of Cree and he becomes part of this, uh, you know, this huge destiny, this, uh, this prophecy. And he's got to take out all kinds of bad guys in some gloriously grotesque ways, even if, you know, in, in hindsight, like this was a long time ago, so it's not going to look that grotesque now. We've seen a lot worse since. Uh, but it was pretty damn impressive and shocking and unique, and that still stands, you know? And if you find a machine that you can play this thing on, I think you will be absolutely impressed with the imagination and the production quality. The music was incredible. We don't really see this kind of Polynesian flavored, uh, you know, storytelling that often in the video game industry. And that also was, you know, a very distinctive and cool element of this title. It was followed up by Rise of the Kasai a few years later, which didn't leave quite as much of a mark no pun intended. Uh, the Mark of Cree was something very, very special, and it's a great sort of, um, I think, a, and like a high point or a nice touchstone in the vaunted history of the PlayStation, and I bet you forgot all about it. That's why it's a buried treasure. 
Blade Blur just told me that Mark of Cree is on the PS4, and that is super cool. And I figured out how to eject my... I was pressing the wrong button. So I, I'm loading up... Uh, oh, there was a pro... Oh, this, this thing has to sign me in. That's what it is. I'm not online here. Okay, we'll figure that out. But uh, today is also the release day. I know it's God of War week, but today is also the release day of a very cool franchise from Sega. I've reviewed this already, but it, they gave it to us very uh, a long time ago. Here's my review of Yakuza 6. Sega sent me the code for Yakuza 6, the song of life, and I got a great big smile on my face because I have grown to really love the Yakuza series, and this is the most up-to-date version of this franchise. It's brand new, uh, has, you know, amazing visuals, the best visuals that we've seen in this franchise. Uh, really, really cool character designs. We're following the exploits of Kazuma Kiryu, the same guy that we've been watching all the way through the Yakuza games, although this time he feels like he's trying to kind of reform he takes responsibility for some of his duplicitous actions in the past and goes to prison, serves his sentence, uh, and he's sort of away from the people that he cares about and loves for three years. And he comes out and he realizes that one of the people that he really loves has been uh, hit in a uh, hit and run accident and is in a coma in the hospital and he has to take care of her baby. And so uh, Kiryu is this uh, guy that suddenly he's like Mr. Mom. And it's a very strange uh, direction in a, in a game series that is just rife with strange directions. Yakuza, as we all know, is kind of like a, uh, um, it's like a mini game collection. Like there's just so many different things that you can do that you can spend a lot of time doing that are not the main through line of the experience. Uh, you can play arcade games, of course, the Sega, you know, staples like Super Hang On and Outrun are in there, but then also Virtual Fighter V is in here, which is insane, and Puyo Puyo, and you can play them uh, uh, two player as well, which is crazy. You can play baseball, you can play darts, you can have conversations with uh, hostesses and hostess bars. There's karaoke. You can go, uh, you know, fishing underwater. Uh, there's home run derbies. It's a ton of things that will capture your attention. And this is the way that you play this game. It's like you sit down, you say, okay, I'm going to like solve some stuff. I'm going to get into the story a little bit here. And then you get into a fight because you do a ton of fighting. Like almost everything is solved uh, in the sort of the main story plot line stuff by kicking the crap out of gang members. You beat up drunks. You beat up triad people and lots of yakuza's and just tough guy idiots that uh, think they can take down Kiryu some, but they cannot. And he just demolishes lots and lots of people in here. And you pick up bicycles and signs and baseballs and baseball bats and anything that you can find around you, swords. And you just waste people. Uh, you do a lot of that, but then you see a little dot. Or maybe you see a little controller symbol on the map and you go, well, I wonder what's in there. And then you go in there and then you find yourself playing darts for four hours. And then you go, okay, that's enough of that. And then you like walk over and there's a cute little kitty and you're like, well, I got to feed this cat. So you go buy some cat food and then you feed the cat. And all of it is sort of adding to the experience points, but also... You, you know, the latent fun and experience of playing a Yakuza game. And they're so weird and quirky and funny. And, and you know, there's also like this really sort of human and, and drama infused, you know, plot thread all the way through here. Like, you have to really start to care about this little baby that you're taking care of. There are mini games where you're like lifting the kid and swinging the kid. You know, you got to get milk for the kid. You don't want it to be screaming. Um, and you actually have this whole other diversion where you go to Hiroshima. Uh, so you've got stuff that's sort of set in Tokyo. And then you also go to this more, uh, a smaller town with a different kind of setup, with different kinds of uh, people. Still incredibly violent Yakuza-led people. And you get sort of sucked into the underbelly. Uh, and there's also a lot of empathetic souls and people that kind of feel for you and understand your play. You just want to take care of the people that you care about. <laughs> It works on all of these different levels against your better sense, you know, because there's a lot of really long expository cut sequences. Thankfully, you can skip through a lot of the dialogue that just takes a long time to get through. Like it's okay, 
I get. It's beautifully rendered. It's really nice, but you see a lot of the same repeated themes and a lot of the same types of conversations, a lot of the same uh, sort of encounters. The like, same things happen as you encounter these people over and over again. But you also get sucked in. This is a great game. Again, I'm I'm hooked, man. I think Sega has got a, a, a lovely franchise with the Yakuza games, and they're very hard to put down. I mean, I do feel like because I've dipped into this well a few times now on this system, I kind of get it. I wish they would maybe take a little breath, like I, I was playing a little bit of Kiwami not too long ago when I reviewed Yakuza 0. So a little breath now before we get more, uh, but still hard to disqualify Yakuza 6 as anything less than really, really fun. I'm going to give Yakuza 6 an 8.5 out of 10. So congratulations to Steven Silva. I understand you got the uh, the code. I'm having trouble signing back into my Xbox. I don't know what is going on here. Uh, so I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be able to play this game. So I'm going to try. I've got Ninja uh, Guide in Black plugged in, um, but it's not letting me play. So our Let's Play in chat might be... Uh, I can't sign in. Nope, couldn't sign you in. There's a problem. Don't know why. Xbox, you got to fix this crap. This is unbelievable. Um, I've got internet. I'm going to I'm going to eject this game. I'm going to pop something else back in here. Let's see. Let's try Panzer Dragoon Horda. Let's see if this works. Live streaming is hard. Yes, it is. Switching between games is hard. Everything was working fine with SSX. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, the title screen came up. Let's see. Let's give it a shot. I did pre-download everything, Blade Blur. Thank you. So this is loading up, and then it's going to hopefully say, okay, you're all right to play this. There is a problem. Couldn't sign you in. Okay, so uh, I think that's uh, that's going to do it for us. Unless uh, we've got a couple of chat uh, chat questions. Is anybody asking any questions? Somebody says blow on the console. Uh, no, it's uh, it's not. I'm I'm certainly online. I've been able to get everywhere, but for some reason. Try SSX again, because we know that one. I'll try SSX again. Okay, let's give it a shot. Oops, let's try this. Okay. This is crazy. This hasn't happened before. Uh, we, ha we haven't switched games, to be fair, though, in the middle of a live stream before. I'm sure this won't work because it's not seeing me. It's not letting me sign in. How awesome is it to be playing SSX3 in 2017? Well, it's 2018, Wizard of Loneliness. <laughs> it is awesome. says, the only thing down now is the Fox News app. Who am I? There was a problem. We couldn't sign you in. Try again in a few minutes. That's Why? nuts. Why was it before? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Will you ever stream Steam games? Absolutely, JBJ Blaze and TFA. Absolutely. I can't wait to hook up my PC and, uh, and stream some of my library that way. Uh, Vic, did you ground yourself before you touched your console? I always had to do that before playing my favorite cult classics, Cross, con cross Country Canada. Very good. Um... Uh, uh, I think that's uh, ah, the beauties of software updates for backwards compatibility. No, everything was loaded. I preloaded everything in. For some reason, my damn Xbox, and I'm really pissed off, is not letting me log on to my uh, account. And I don't know why. And that's it's driving me nuts. But uh, I can't do it. Um, uh, Xbox will hear from me. Uh, but uh, I think that's going to be it, guys. I'm sorry. I wanted to stream some and do some uh, streaming and chatting, but we can't do it today. Uh, but I will stream some once I get all of this stuff figured out, okay? All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow with a brand new EP Live.